United States has been the definitive home to the TV animation industry since its boom, but Canada, not so much. They've had a couple successes here and there, like Inspector Gadget and Total Drama, but due to the way Canadian television functions, the cartoons it produces typically don't have as much time and heart poured into them as their American counterparts, and they can come off to foreign audiences as cheap and mass-produced. But again, there have been a couple success stories that have come from Maple Syrup Land, not the least of which was one of the biggest hits on US TV ever. Ed, Ed and Eddie, Cartoon Network's Three Stooges. I don't blame you if you just found out it was a Canadian production because it's unlike the rest of the animation that comes out of the country. It's ugly and strange, yet energetic, spontaneous, filled to the lid with character. For a while, it was the most popular show on one of America's de facto children's stations. All of this is common knowledge to a fan of the show, but to an outsider looking in, this is just absurd. And to be quite honest, I was one of those outsiders for a long time. I caught a few airings on Australasian Cartoon Network and liked what I saw, but not enough to be an avid fanatic of the series. But I'm older now, I have thicker skin, and I want to see what all the fuss is about. Ed Ed and Eddie was a creation of cartoonist Dan Antonucci, whose previous work included the cult short film Lupo the Butcher and the MTV series The Brothers Grunt. Although it's easy for us to dismiss these works as gross and edgy, these weren't necessarily bad things in the 80s and 90s. Seeing an Italian butcher bleed to death while swearing actually proved a lot about animation's appeal to adults, and the brothers grunt, conversely, proved that disturbing adult humour can go too far and lose its appeal. Not a good show at all, but it placed a limit on what animation fanatics could tolerate, so its existence isn't completely useless. Around 1996, after forming AKA Cartoons, Jesus Christ What a Logo, a friend of Antonucci's dared him to make a children's cartoon, and he took some characters from a commercial he was working on, gave them all the exact same name, and faxed his ideas through to Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. But when both networks wanted... Dan decided to stick with the one that was more willing to let him do his thing, Cartoon Network. Although this turned out to be a pretty big blow for Nickelodeon, Remember that this was right after Ren and Stimpy pushed every boundary imaginable, both for the network and behind the scenes. Even some of Rocco's jokes were pushing it. I completely understand why they'd have to start being more responsible for their shows. At the same time, Cartoon Network was still the new kid on the block with a lot to prove, and their first big push too far was still a while away. That's why I think this show about three Ed Boys was better off airing on Cartoon Network, but I digress. Antonucci gradually assembled a show bible over the coming months, basing most of the world on his experiences as a kid, and it eventually went into full production at AKA Cartoons in 1997, a first for Cartoon Network, not being produced at Hanna-Barbera, or needing a pilot episode to prove itself worthy. The show was initially set to premiere in the fall of 1998, but for unknown reasons was pushed back to January 4th, 1999, but that didn't stop it from having one of the funniest new show campaigns I've ever seen. What is that? That is Ed. How about that? That's Ed. I thought he was Ed. No, he's Ed. Is that not what I said? No, you said he was Ed. Is he an Ed too? Well, he's an Ed, but he's not Ed. Which Ed is he not? Neither one. He's Eddie. So he gets a Y. A Y. Y. That's right. But he's an Ed because he starts with Ed. No, he starts with Ed and Ed catches up. So it's Eddie, Ed, and Ed. No, it's Ed, Ed, and Eddie. What's the difference? It's much less confusing that way. Right out the gate, it counted a pretty strong following from child viewers, but a more divisive one from older viewers. You'll see on web chats during the show's first couple seasons that it was accused of being loud and dumb, like every cartoon is, let's be reasonable. But those complaints mellowed out over time as it became more widely appealing. It wasn't long before it became second in command to the Powerpuff Girls in Cartoon Network's roster. Heck, when Powerpuff Girls ended in 2005, one could argue Ed, Ed and Eddie was now the network's golden goose. But it wouldn't last long. The last couple years the show spent on TV saw it becoming rusty in a couple departments, so its episodic run ended peacefully with a one episode length season 6 on June 29th, 2008. Hey, it wouldn't be a successful Canadian cartoon if it didn't last 9 years, that's some sort of odd trend with the country. I personally don't count the big picture show since that's a TV movie, but I do consider it a valid and fitting into the franchise, it premiering on November 8th, 2009. I know that's a more in-depth history than you're used to, but this was a very important show to Cartoon Network and should be treated as such. But is it any good? Well, that's also a long story and mostly a good one. Your typical setup for an episode of the show involves three preteen boys, dim-witted Ed, neurotic Double D, and greedy Eddie, causing mayhem in their cul-de-sac through various means. 
generally through low effort cloning schemes designed to swindle the neighborhood kids out of their money so they can buy jawbreakers, which in this world are the size of watermelons. The kids' parents are never around for one reason or another, so typically their karma comes from either the kids retaliating against them after being duped, another set of kids, the Kanker sisters, getting in their way to flirt with them, or slapstick violence, that works too. It's all simple enough to grasp within a couple watches, but it leaves the door wide open enough to squeeze in a lot of creative possibilities. What kind of scams are the Eds pulling this time? How do the other kids feel about it? The show essentially plays out like a long childhood fantasy, with the rose tinted glasses pulled off and the cruelty back in full force. But due to, or in spite of the show's nature, only a couple locations are ever seen. It's usually just the street, a construction site, maybe the houses, and in the later seasons, the school. Oh yeah, they added a school. In 2005, the show was given a soft revival for its fifth season, with the cul-de-sac kids now attending Peach Creek Junior High. Some characters got a little more out of the new setting, but it did shine a light on the show's weaknesses, with rarely being allowed to show background characters, adults, or new characters in general. The school can sometimes feel empty with 13 students at most, and yes, I'm counting Plank. I'll elaborate on my feelings towards season 5 and 6 in a couple minutes, but when I think of Ed, Ed and Eddie, the endless summer feel of the first four seasons is what comes to mind, and it's an entertaining, albeit not very cheery, feeling. On to characters. Although all the Eds get top billing, they make it no secret that Eddie's the main character of the show. But I have to say, I'm not a big fan of him. He's a massive jerk to his closest friends, and his voice, iconic as it is, grated on me after six seasons in a movie. But without him, most of the show's conflict and action wouldn't happen, so although I'm not super fond of him, I'll give him that, he's useful to the series. I'm gonna be a real normie now and say Double D was my favourite of the Eds. Perhaps a little too clean and relatable for this sort of show, but that's still warranted for it. If you couldn't tell, he's the level-headed one, though he has his moments of geekiness and obsessive-compulsive behaviour. That just leaves plain old Ed, and what better description than that? He's let his brain rot with comic books and horror movie marathons, and usually serves to run around yelling what's on his mind. Ed is one of those bumbling idiot characters that's so good that you don't really need to explain him. One thing that's great about all the Eds is their run cycles, proving so much about how line of action can add to a cartoon character immensely. But Sarah and Jimmy are different beasts. Sarah being Ed's bratty younger sister, and Jimmy being an effeminate boy that Sarah hangs out with to comfort. They're some of the show's most irritating characters and didn't exactly need to exist, but they somehow got more tolerable as the show went on, at least in my opinion. And then there's Kevin, the cool kid on the block who can see through all the Ed's shenanigans. I think he's a useful character in that regard, in spite of his tendency to call them dorks in every episode. It's something I'm always anticipating, but only because it gets so played out. Now Rolf, he's the best character bar none, an amalgamation of every folk village trait under the sun, you never know what you're gonna get with him. He's not just funny, he's outright fascinating. Naz is Kevin's girlfriend and yeah. She got a spotlight episode here and there, but she mostly just served to boost Kevin's ego. Not a bad addition to the show though, she makes Kev feel a little more down to earth. You've also got Johnny 2x4, who's more of a social outcast than the Eds, believe it or not. He's always in his own little world and his best friend is Plank, a board of wood that only he can listen to. Not even I can, I guess you have to be an undying fan of the show to do so. When everyone else is against the Eds, I can at least count on Johnny and Plank for some levity to the circumstance. That just leaves the Kanker sisters, the Eds' arch nemesis. Marie, May and Lee respectively always try to control and belittle the Eds whenever they get their cootie infested hands on them, and once again I'll say it, although they're not the most dimensional characters except maybe Marie, they're useful to the narratives always being bigger fish for the Eds to get eaten by. So the show only really has these characters, until the movie, but it's an expansive, expressive cast that I don't adore but don't mind at all. There's a lot of imagination in the show's writing, at the start at least. You can tell by the feel of the show that it's storyboard driven, with action driving almost every sequence and every dialogue exchange. It's not action action as in Samurai Jack, but instant constant kinetic energy. The jokes and cartoony gags always have a purpose and push the narratives forward until they meet their final conclusion. That's how it always should be, but Eddie and Eddie knows that better than any animated TV show I've ever seen. It's complemented well by top-notch sound design, with so many sound effects being used that it's hard to keep track of them all. The general story structure, great as it is, starts to become formulaic after a while. To give some credit, they do understand that a fair way through and make jokes about it like Phineas and Ferb did. But unlike that show, they don't try to twist or subvert it later on. 
This makes it a little harder to remember specific episodes, and what makes it way harder is that the episode titles suck dirty hairballs. Every single one, except the later specials, is a play on words with Ed's name thrown in. Sure, he appears in every episode, but he's not the focus of every episode, so why do it? Not helping is that the puns can be pretty lame, and it's easy to lose track of what season an episode is from, or even confuse it for another episode. For instance, it came from Outer Ed. Is that the one where Ed thinks he's a monster and rampages through the cul-de-sac? No, it's the one where he makes up scams based on his comic books. The Rampage episode is the day that Ed stood still, which can easily be confused for the Eds are coming, the Eds are coming, and vice versa. I'm curious how high of an IQ you need to remember every title and plot and match them in your head 24-7. I better cool off and talk about how mean this show is. Kids can be cruel. We can? Thanks, Mom! And this show holds nothing back in the department of schadenfreude comedy, which is basically an intellectual way of saying it's mean-spirited. Naturally, in other shows, the more you focus on how mean a character or set of characters is, the harder it is to sympathize with them and stop being sucked into the world the writers have created. But given no one in Ed, Ed and Eddie is a saint, and they're all at the butt of slapstick at some point or another, it matches the tone of everything. I agree the karmic distribution can get out of whack at points, and that's what makes some of the show's worst episodes, but still, no outcome ever feels lazy. It always depends on what the writers and storyboarders felt was the most interesting direction to go in, not whichever kid they wanted to punch in the face that day. Now with animation, what do I talk about first? Art direction? Visual design? Animation, maybe? You won't really know it by viewing frame grabs, so let's be daredevils and switch to clips. Notice how wavy the lines are. This is a style known as squiggle vision, where almost every cell of a character is drawn from the ground up and not just an extra layer for the mouth to go over. Given the kinetic energy mentality I've already gone over with the creative process, I couldn't have asked for a more fitting art style. At worst, everybody looks like they're made of gelatin, and at best, it keeps the show alive. And that's fitting since Dan Antonucci was an advocate for traditional cell animation, with Ed, Ed and Eddie being the last western cartoons to use cells, all the way up to 2004. The art style kept improving over the course of the first four seasons, but it was eventually time to switch to digital ink and paint with season 5 to save costs. I'm gonna come clean and say, I love the digital look more than the cell look. It allowed for even faster and more frantic action, and delivered camera angles and sequences that wouldn't have been as pretty on cells. But that's about the limit for things season 5 improved on. Let me explain my thoughts on each individual season, best I can since identifying episodes as a blur. Season 1 was another one of those very rough season 1s, with some pretty unappealing animation at points, and some aspects that didn't feel right. Stories were wild and juicy from the word go, however, and Season 2 improves on everything drastically. I'd say it's the best because the character designs are more defined, and the jokes are a lot more consistent and genuinely gut-busting. The third, though not an outright decline, I think has lower lows but equally high highs. Second verse same as the first despite the duds, and Season 4 is where the gravy starts to hit the fan. The kids got a lot meaner and the story's more repetitive, I feel, but 5 saw more changes that didn't quite seem right. Namely the new school setting, a sudden switch to Autumn, and Eddie becoming a genuine bully now. As for season 6, it's one episode long, what can I say about it? Except it going for a winter aesthetic that I actually kind of dig. The reason it's only one episode long, so short that you're better off lumping it in with season 5, is because the staff opted to do a full-blown TV movie to wrap up the show instead of continue with this rusty train here. I'll get to that movie in a moment, I promise, but I think you know what time it is. That's right! It's worst episodes time! Just getting the worst out of the way so I can end positively this time. Starting with Look Into My Eds, where the Eds get a hypnotism kit that makes everyone lose their pupils and the animation alone makes this a turn off. It's just really creepy and not in a funny manner either. After that is Button Your Ed, where Eddie gets his fly stuck in his throat and they make him communicate with a cowbell. Fun fact, this episode takes place in an alternate universe where writing doesn't exist! Why are they just relying on the cowbell and letting their random thoughts fill in the blanks? Watching floss your ear is like pulling teeth. But yeah, it's about Eddie wanting one of Ed's teeth that's come loose. There is a lot of tooth abuse in this one, and Ed eating sewer gunk at the end, which has the teeth in it. Renter Ed has some decent ideas, but the overheating Easy Bake Oven scene was obnoxious, and them turning Johnny's house into a sauna has me more worried about the kid's health than entertained. It's not every day you meet someone whose least favorite Eddie and Eddie episodes from season 3, so I'll have to fill the void. X marks the Ed is horrible. 
Eddie gets a zit that keeps growing more bulbous and disgusting over the course of the episode, and they make it so the cul-de-sac kids pick on him for it, and that he doesn't have a happy ending, his head becomes the zit. The gross out, the meanness, the randomness, everything that makes the show off-putting is here and accounted for. My Fair Ed's another one of my absolute least favourites. Essentially, Ed and Eddie act like monstrous little hoodlums one day, so Double D makes them nicer, only for that to also backfire. Incredibly annoying and in your face with a twist that can be seen by the blind. Is there an Ed in the house has Sarah at her worst, faking a cold, and most of the story is just Jimmy and Ed fighting over who gets to take care of her. It overshadows the driving school subplot which had potential for an episode of its own. Kicking off season 4 is the infamous If It Smells Like an Ed where Jimmy puts together a friendship day then hypocritically frames the Eds for a prank to get back at them for being mean to him. Despite it being an important step in making Jimmy a more interesting character, snapping part of the effeminate facade, it's still pretty boring and drawn out and not a fun watch even your first time round. Pain in the Ed, got that right, is the one where Ed has to take up violin and he's really bad at it. Like wow, the violin playing alone makes this one unwatchable. I also think there should be more at stake than Sarah being a tattletale if anything should happen to it. Thick as an Ed is about how bad Ed smells due to a piece of cheese he's been holding onto for a long time. Sound fun? No? Well, there you are. Stiff Upper Ed involves Sarah and Jimmy creating a fancy rich club that Eddie for some reason wants to joy, despite not liking them or ever wanting to be fancy. It ends with him and the other Eds becoming butlers and being abused by the others in different ways. The typical Ed and Eddie formula was getting old by this point. But Mission Ed Possibles showed just how exaggerated the characters were by that point, school setting or not. Eddie's a complete maniac, Double D shows no guilt in getting his friends in trouble, and it's not really a story as much as it is a long chase scene home. After that, cleanliness is next to Edness is where Double D has a hard time staying clean one day, and he eventually turns himself into a garbage monster. Yep, totally rational, and also really gross. Cool Hand Ed is an espionage mission to escape the school before 3 o'clock, but it takes until 3 o'clock for everything to be put together. You guys know you can just leave by sunset, right? This won't hurt an Ed, where Eddie messes with Kevin psychologically by playing up his fear of flu shots, did the impossible and made me empathise with Kevin, but only because Eddie was such an irredeemable monster. Kev manages to get back at him and smile for the Ed at least. Would you look at that? One of the few times Eddie's doing something completely innocent and the world dictates that he be treated like crap. But with all this out of the way, despite these episodes being pretty bad, I can always see a lot of energy and wit in them, which I admire as show keeping up for nearly a decade. With that, on to the best episodes. Let's start this off right with Dawn of the Eds, a classic where the Eds get lost in the dump and just dick around, letting their playfulness run rampant. Sure there's a rocket here and there, but it's a very down to earth plot. Laugh Ed Laugh came off as a bit more touching than I think they were intending. When the other kids get hit with chicken pox, Eddie starts to go mad from isolation. Is it because he wants their money, or does he need their company deep down? A Glass of Warm Ed, the sleepwalking episode, reveals more of the gluttonous side of Ed's character, and making for a neat subgenre of episodes where the others have to bring him back to reality, and it's going to get better from here. Avasti Eds was a great way to close out season 1, with the Eds and Johnny going for a sailing trip, but getting into a pirate battle with the Kankers. And as if that doesn't excite you, wait till you get to see Double D's instrument playing. Favourite episode's gotta be 1 plus 1 equals Ed, partly because it's the easiest title to remember, but mainly because of how experimental it is. The Eds try to be scientists and poke around at how the world works, but it wasn't wise to do that in the cartoon as they end up breaking reality. They did a great job in making this one a trip. Any Meeny Miny Ed's another great one, with Eddie exploiting Ed's gullibility by making him believe aliens are in the cul-de-sac and paying the price by getting stuck in a trash can. What else can I say? It's just fun. Urban Ed was just a great idea executed brilliantly. Eddie creates a city made of boxes for the kids to spend a day in, and they experience all the hardships of the city life. It makes for great contrast from the suburban environment the show was known for. Scramble Dead is another sleep-based episode where Double D's tired ramblings are turned into scams by the other Eds. Yet another great memorable concept that worked miracles. Ed or Tails really pushes how desperate Eddie is for a jawbreaker, with him so willing to earn one that he'll partake in Rolf's foreign contests to get it. This one admittedly gets a little aimless, but it's amazingly funny from beginning to end. 
Ed Pass It On is the first time we get a real sense of presence from Eddie's mysterious older brother, with Eddie creating a rumor that he's coming back to scare everyone into respecting him. It goes to show the effect rumors can have on a group of people, but it does it in a way that adds world building. That's something that almost never happens in kids shows. The day that Ed was coming is another one centered on Ed's naivete, and he actually believes he's a B-movie monster. It's an adventure this one, and one of the few times all the other kids work together without a problem. And Ed is born shows the lengths Eddie will go to to impress his older brother, with a phony baloney video about how cool he is, and it's a good place for him to vent out his ego humorously. Don't Rain On My Ed is another chase scene focused episode, but done way better. It has a real goal this time, Jawbreakers being sold for free, and way funnier, more character filled gags. They Call Him Mr. Ed is another great example of all the characters being childlike. When Eddie creates an office space, they all jump to the chance to do pretend business work alongside him, then bail on him when they realize they're not getting paid. What a blunt, honest swerve. Stuck in Ed, I think was a better example of Jimmy's character development, with him putting together a pretty good scam and leaving Eddie in the dust. Who wouldn't want a fridge sized popsicle? Seriously. Moving into the digital era, the hanky panky hullabaloo is shameless shipping fuel, but look at this, I can care about the Kanker sisters, when they start getting hit by Cupid's arrows. Although not every ship is everyone's cup of tea, all the characters are used in creative ways at least. Too Smart for His Own Ed, I'd say was a better integration of school pressure than most season 5 episodes, with Ed being treated as smarter than Double D for winning a spelling bee, which I like. I also like how he's still not really smart and the ending speaks volumes of that. My favourite special of the show is The End is Standing Still, The Ed is Standing Still, which like the similarly titled episode before it, is more adventurous and uses all the characters well while turning down their jerky attributes. I'm gonna be daring now and talk about 50% of season 6. May I have this Ed, the school dance episode, which was a fun romp that kept all the awkwardness of a school dance intact, and at least all the Eds are happy at the end. Now, no review of Ed, Ed and Eddie would be complete without discussing the series finale TV movie, Ed, Ed and Eddie's Big Picture Show. In it, the Eds have finally pulled a scam so hazardous that they have to leave the cul-de-sac and seek help from Eddie's older brother. They have to find him first in the great big world, and the rest of the kids are on their tail, ready to give them their just desserts. Big Picture Show was a great name for the movie, because it puts all the characters' actions into a wider perspective. We see them deal with the outside world in their own ways, and get into more raw arguments that kids can identify with and characters that needed to kick up the rear at this point got a really good booting. What the special will always be known for, however, is the ending, where Eddie finally catches up with his older brother, the only new character or adult to ever appear in the franchise, but he bullies and beats him up mercilessly. After he gets beaten near to death and accidentally knocks his brother unconscious in the process, he eventually apologizes for all his actions, and he and the other Eds are finally accepted as part of the cul-de-sac once and for all. Though not the best finale ever, that's up to debate and I haven't seen enough, it's easily the most satisfying. 11 years of being a greedy outcast, finally lifted by an earnest apology. It paints the moral of the whole show as, reflect on your actions and apologize for them if you need to. At this point, I was liking the show more than ever. This was opening the door to dozens of new opportunities. No time left? It's the end of the movie? And with that, Eddie and Eddie was over. And it has been for a decade now. Danny Antonucci and the rest of the crew are working on different projects now, and Tony Sampson, the voice of Eddie, retired from voice acting after this. Oh jeez. I mean, oh jeez. This makes a revival of the show seem unlikely at this point, but you know Cartoon Network. I think the future of this series is going to lie in its past, with nostalgic fans and cartoon enthusiasts going back to it for years to come. While I wouldn't say I love this show, it was pretty much asking to be put in the critical line of fire at points, I still respect it as one of the most iconic animated shows from the 90s, 2000s, Cartoon Network and Canada, and easily the most iconic from AKA Cartoon. But who knows, I hope there are some nicer, friendlier cartoons from Canada. Goodbye for now.